that's what it's all about. He one soul at a time. That's how we make this world a better place. Um, if I was to tell you uh, that there was a Old Testament king that everything that he did, he succeeded at. Everything that he did prospered. Would you be able to guess which one it was? A lot of people would go to King David. He was the most famous, but it wasn't him. Some people would guess Solomon, his son, because he was the wisest and the richest. But you would be wrong, it wasn't him either. Some people would guess King Saul, because he was the first appointed king of Israel, but it wasn't him either. It was a king that we don't hear about that often, yet when God is referring to him, he says that everything that he did, he succeeded. He was prosperous in every way. His relationships, his financial ability, his planning strategically of war, everything he did was successful. And when I read something like that, I want to know, well, what's your secret? Because, you know, it's nice to hear somebody succeed, but, and I'm like, that's great, but I want to know how you got there. Well, this gentleman, his name was King Hezekiah. And we're going to talk a little bit about King Hezekiah. When I was growing up, the only thing really that I heard about him was at one time his life was going to be shortened and he was able to uh, persuade God differently. But I didn't hear a whole lot about the rest of his life leading up to that. And so I want to do a little bit of a backstory with him. I want you to go with me on this journey of finding out why he was such a success, what it was that he did that was different than what everybody else had done around him. I want to read in 2 Kings chapter 18 and verses 2 through 7, and we're talking about Hezekiah here. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother was Zechariah's daughter, Abby. He did what the Lord considered to be right, according to everything that his ancestor David had done. He removed the high places, demolished the sacred pillars, and tore down the Asherah poles. And what that was is that was like, uh, they looked like totem poles. They were pillars that they would put up with different idols on them, and you were to worship them. He also demolished the bronze serpent that Moses had crafted because the Israel had been burning incense to it right up until that time. In other words, they started worshiping this statue that Moses had made. Hezekiah called it a piece of brass. He trusted the Lord God of Israel, and after him, there were none like him among all the kings of Judah. Because he depended on the Lord, not abandoning pursuit of him, and keeping the Lord's commandments that he had commanded Moses. So the Lord was with him. Hezekiah prospered wherever he went, even when he rebelled against the king of Assyria, refusing to serve him. So it gives you a little bit of a clue here about why God was with him. He was committed to living the right life. He destroyed idols, and he would talk with God about decisions. He would follow the things that he knew was right. He was always committed to God, even unto death. In Isaiah, Isaiah comes along after many years, and Hezekiah gets a terminal illness. Isaiah is told by God, go and tell Hezekiah, get your house in order get everything situated, because you're not going to pull through this one. When I was younger and I heard the story, I heard that Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, and he began to cry, and God changed his mind. 
But it wasn't the fact that he just cried. It was the fact of what Hezekiah told God in this prayer. And so I want to read in Isaiah chapter 38 and verses 1 through 5, and let's see what it is that Hezekiah tells God that changes God's mind. It says, during this time, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. Then Amma's son, Isaiah, the prophet, came to him and told him, this is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you're going to die. You won't recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed this to the Lord. He said, please, Lord, remember how I walked before you faithfully and with a true heart. And I have done what pleases you. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then this message from the Lord came to Isaiah. Go tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord God of your ancestor David has to say. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. So I will add 15 years to your life. It was what Hezekiah did that led up to that prayer, that caused God to change his mind. How amazing is it that your prayer, your plea to God is so powerful that you could change what God had pretty much set in stone as a fact. But why? Why was he allowed to live those extra 15 years? What was it that he did, besides crying, that changed God's heart. If God was to come to us today and he was to say, get your house in order, you're not going to pull through this one, your time's up. And if you weren't ready to go, if you still had life experiences that you wanted to have, if you still wanted to be with your loved ones, and you were to say, God, I want to remind you of the life I've lived, how would that measure up? Would he look at the last years of your life since you become a Christian and go, you know what? Yeah, you've made a difference. Yeah, you've done the things that were pleasing to me. I'm going to add some more time to your life. Or would he look at our life and say, you know, you really haven't done a whole lot with the time that I've given you. You haven't done a lot with the money to help others. You haven't used a lot of your talents to grow my kingdom. No, I think you're finished here. I think we're going to go ahead and call you home. See, what we forget is that the time that we're here, we're here for a reason. It's like the training ground for heaven. The time that we're here, there's several things that he wants us to do. And Hezekiah will point those out by his life of those things that we need to do if we want to prosper in everything that we do. I like that. I would like that on my resume. Everything that she tried was a success. Everything, every choice that she made, it prospered. That's a great goal to have, but how do we get there? And I'm going to tell you in today's sermon before we close of how we get there. And I think this is a very fitting sermon for the first sermon of the new year. Hezekiah, he was a, he was a good steward over his life. The Bible tells us that we should be careful how we live and to make the best use of our time because then he's more likely to extend our life. So what is God's will for making the best of our time? What is it that Hezekiah did? While we're here on earth, we are to learn and grow. We're not to live a self-centered life. We're to live a God-centered life. See, 
God wants to be the focus of everything in your life. That's why Hezekiah succeeded. Every decision, he didn't just jump into a decision because it sounded good. He asked God about it. Sometimes we have a tendency to think, well, if this just came out of the blue, I wasn't even looking for a job, and all of a sudden this door opened up, and it's the best job of my life, and we take it because surely that's a blessing, right? And perhaps it is a blessing, but did you stop and pray first? You meet the love of your life. Oh, that person's an answer to prayer. Yes, let's get married. But did you pray about it? See, because if you want your heart to have very few heartaches, the way to help you in that area is ask God these decisions. It may look good on paper. It may sound great. But is it from God? See, that's what Hezekiah, that's why he succeeded at everything he did. Because he took it to the one who had all the answers. That's a wonderful privilege that we have that we don't take advantage of. Why? Because we start living a self-centered life rather than a God-centered life. And if you want this life to be prosperous and longer on earth, then it matters what you do with this life. Why would God invest in someone and give them a longer life if they weren't going to do anything with it? to help bring his kingdom here on earth. So see, I'm telling you this morning how you can extend your life and how it can be an even better life by following what it was that Hezekiah did. Number one, God was the center of his life. He was the main focus of his life. He wasn't just part of his life. He wasn't just an extra lifeline in case he needed it and got into a scary situation. God was his life. Why Hezekiah? He was wise. He knew by reading the scrolls and hearing the stories of how God would help them succeed when the whole world was caving in on them. How when there was an impossible situation, God would come to the forefront and he studied what kind of life did this person live to have that kind of power at their grasp. He wasn't put here on earth. We aren't put here on earth to have a life that revolves around us. We're put here to have a God-centered life. Earth is our training ground for heaven. He puts us here on earth to learn how to love. Why? Because God is love. In the Bible, when they ask Jesus what the greatest commandment is, he says the first and the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. How can I help you fall in love with God? By telling you that every good thing that you've ever experienced in your life is because of Him. Every encouraging word that you've ever received is because of His goodness. Every person that was put into your life that brings you great joy and happiness it's from him. He's the giver of all good things. That's help is how to help you fall in love with him. He wants a relationship. That's why he even said when Adam was here on earth, it's not good for man to be alone. He also said a man is in an island that lives by himself. He wants a relationship, and that still boggles my mind that this almighty God wants a relationship with me, with you. 
He cares about the things that you care about. He wants to hear about the things that upset you. He wants to be there in the times when you're sad and help you grow and learn through these times. You can't get any better than that. And Hezekiah had figured this out. Every decision that he made that was going to have any kind of impact, he went to God with it first. That's kind of like if going through school, if your teachers would say, I'm going to give you a book that has all the answers to every test in it. You'd be a fool to not pick up that book when a test came, to use that book that's at your disposal. That's why they say that the man who says there's no God, he's a fool, because he has this opportunity to talk to the one that knows all the answers, to talk to the one that sees it all, to talk to the one that can keep you safe when bad times are coming upon this world. He's the answer that we need for everything. And Hezekiah had figured this out. God wants us to enjoy his love and to love him back. That's what we call worship. So to fulfill his purpose, that's one of the greatest purposes Jesus tells us. So to know if he's the center, you ask yourself, what is the focus of my life? What do I wake up thinking about? What do I plan for? What is the number one focus of my life? Oh, then my friend, that has become your God. And God doesn't want to be second fiddle. He wants to be the main character because he could make every area of your life better. The second thing that God wants us to do that Hezekiah did and even reminded him that he has obeyed him and he has made an impact in people's life is God wants us to love him and to love others. He says, that's my kids. He even goes so far in the Bible to say that you can't say that you love me and you don't love people. Wow. So if you want to know God's purpose in your life, it's for you to learn to love people because you're not going to get away from them. When you go to heaven, it's going to be pretty packed. And if you can't stand people down here on earth, you're going to have a real hard time. God wants you to learn how to love. doesn't mean that you have to like them, but you have to learn how to love them. Why? Because they're the apple of God's eye. Jesus died for them on the cross. You don't have to love their ways, but you have to learn how to love them enough to pray for them and to get along with them. The other thing that Hezekiah did is he says, I have obeyed your commandments, meaning he has grown in wisdom and he has spiritually grown. God wants us to grow up spiritually. He doesn't want us to be babes in Christ. What's really sad is people grow old, not necessarily grow up. I was always surprised at that. In fact, several years ago, I was surprised when I ran across an adult that pouted. For some reason, I thought that was child things that you outgrow and your parents help force you to outgrow that. And it was so odd to see a 50-year-old act like a preschooler. And it took me a while to realize, oh, they grow old. That doesn't necessarily mean that they've grown up. In fact, Paul was upset at some Christians that had been Christians for so long. And he says, I'm still having to feed you with a bottle. But see, the goal is for you to grow up spiritually so that you can reach others. That's part of the training ground here on earth. And then the other reason that God extended Hezekiah's life is Hezekiah gave back. He gave back to the people that he was in charge of. He gave back to God's kingdom. The purpose in 
that he has for our life here, especially if we want to live a good, long, prosperous life, is to give back. He says, I don't want you just to serve me. I want you to serve your brothers and sisters. I want you to serve others. See, that's what's called ministry. A lot of people want to be great leaders because they want to be able to influence people and have this, this leadership role, this prestige, but they have it all wrong in their mind. They're seeking it. Some people are seeking it for the wrong reason because, see, to be a great leader means you're the best servant of all. To lead means that you serve the people that you are leading. That is your ministry. So how do we serve God? By serving others. Some Christians have it wrong. They think, well, we serve God by reading our Bible and getting that knowledge. We serve God by praying. We serve God by putting money in the offering plate. Those are a type of serving God. But if you're not serving your brothers and sisters, if you're not serving to make the kingdom better, if you're not serving those that God calls you to make a difference in, then those others are just works. You're not really serving God. But because Hezekiah was serving God and giving back to others, God said, you know what? I'm going to let you hang around some more. Because I see all the good things that you've done. You have a, a child and the child's still young and you want to be in that child's life to watch them grow and to hold your grandchildren. One of the ways that you can help secure that is what is the life that you're living now? Are you making an impact? Are you serving one another? Are you learning how to love his people? Are you making God the center of your life? If you do those things, you have a much better chance of extending your life here on earth. The last thing that God wants us to do while we're here on earth is to tell others about Jesus. We have been sent here on earth to spread the good news. Do you know that's why you're here? That's why I'm here? You're here to tell those that's here on earth about the Savior. That's the main reason that you're here, that and to learn how to love. Because this really is your training ground. And how you invest here will translate in heaven. Oh, everybody that believes in Jesus as a Savior, you've got your ticket. But heaven's going to have different rewards according to different things that we've done here on earth. There will be different positions in heaven. You're still going to learn. You're still going to grow. So while I'm here, I'm investing not just in this. I'm investing in eternity. You're investing in eternity by every decision that you make. And I'm the kind of person, maybe call me lazy, I don't want to do do-overs do and repeats. I want to be able to check all the boxes I can here on earth so I don't have to go a little bit backwards in heaven. I want to excel to the front. I don't want to have to do it again. I want to be able to learn more wonderful and more exciting things in heaven that I couldn't live, learn here on earth. And the way that I can do that is to make this life count while I'm here. I need to invest in things bigger than myself, which is my heavenly Father. He says that we're here to tell others about Jesus. He says that we are to be a witness. See, nobody has your testimony. Somebody needs to hear your testimony. Some people say, well, I can't tell them about Jesus. I don't know much about the Bible. Oh, you don't need to know about the Bible to tell them about what Jesus has done in your life. See, your story, somebody needs to hear. My story won't move them like your story will, or vice versa. He says, I need you 
to be a witness. You do these things that Hezekiah did, then God's more likely to extend your life and let it be a healthy life. Maybe up until today, we haven't used our life the way that he intended it to be. But now that we know what he expects, then we can get ready to start, start succeeding and prospering in everything that we do and every relationship that you have now that we know what he expects. We can begin to use our life for purposes bigger than us. We can begin to use our life for the things that he made for us. And how do we begin this? We begin by making him the center of our life. The Bible teaches us how to live long and prosper. I not only want to live life, I want to live a life worth living. And I don't know about you, but I'm not ready for this journey to be over yet. So as I get ready to sing, the closing song is Jesus at the center of my life. If he's been pushed to the side and he hasn't been the center of your life, then speaking from experience, get ready for some rough times because he'll do whatever he can to draw you back to him because that's where you're supposed to be. So save yourself a few heartaches, a few bumps in the road, a few failures, a few missteps, and maybe anchor yourself again and say, 2022, maybe 2021, he wouldn't have extended my life if we looked at the decisions I made then. But today I wanna to start new. And Jesus, I can do that if you're the center of my life. God bless you.